So, uh, you know, I'm happy to be here. This is my second time at Data Driven. It's a great event. Uh, I'm going to just, instead of trying to explain how Cockroach works, which is what I did the first time, I'm going to talk about the sorts of problems it solves. And I think that's actually a little bit more fun. Do I have a clicker? So, uh, you know, what we set out to build was really something that could bridge the gap between traditional SQL systems and um, some of the sort of new hotness around NoSQL, right? People like NoSQL because this was a, uh, a means of providing elastic scale and highly available systems. Um, but SQL has, you know, some venerable uh, guarantees that, uh, you know, most you know, established businesses have come to rely on, like strong consistency in transactions. And those are things that were dropped in uh, the early versions of NoSQL. So, you know, Cockroach bridges the gap. It's both of those things. It has both of those things, and it doesn't compromise. So the big differentiators, uh, the first is ultra-resilience, and we put that word ultra in front of it. We're just kind of trying that out at the moment um, to distinguish it from the kind of resilience that people would be familiar with if they've used Oracle Golden Gate, which is asynchronous. This is using synchronous replication. It uses a mechanism called consensus replication. Um, and it, we have this, this idea of multi-active availability, and it's different from what you'd normally expect with active-passive or active-active. Um, you have three or more replicas. They're all active. You can read and write anywhere, and you always get a consistent answer. The, the, the trade-off is latency. We'll get into a little bit of that in the uh, rest of the presentation. The other big thing is elastic global scalability. And this is a really big differentiator. Um, no one else out there uh, is really tackling this problem the way we are at the moment. Um, there's, you know, sort of what you'd expect from NoSQL, it's cloud native, there's no single points of failure. You can add in commodity hardware and make your cluster larger. It rebalances everything for you. There's no downtime while that happens. Um, but we also have uh, capabilities in this to spread the system out over very large geographic distances. In fact, planet scale. And we'll, we'll get into that. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting stuff. And, you know, just in terms of scalability, we recently ran a TPCC uh, 50K, which is uh, 50,000 warehouses. It's, it's a pretty big cluster. Um, and that was over 100 plus nodes. Um, so, you know, it, it does scale. Great, so this is just a, a, a quick refresher. So I'm gonna use these terms and maybe not everyone's familiar with them. The first is recovery time objective. The second is recovery point objective. So when you experience a failure, these are two, ter two concepts that people use to describe how bad the failure is. Uh, you know, the RPO is basically how much data you might have lost. Uh, you know, from sort of a last backup or a last uh, successful replication to a secondary. Um, and then the RTO is how much time since the uh, failure event does it take for you to come back online. And uh, modern systems, I think there's been this sort of uh, a worsening of these, you know, according to the Forrester research. Um, it's gone from, I think, in 2007, it was something like 13 or 30% of failures were resolved in less than one hour. In 2010, it was 10%, uh, something like that. And in 2013, it was less than 3%. So the part of the problem is there's more and more data. Part of the problem is these systems are more complex and intertwined. It's not just your system of record. It's your Kafka queues feeding other systems and uh, lots of different things depending on them. So the industry standard right now for resilience as I mentioned, there's asynchronous replication, so uh, you know, your secondary is eventually consistent. Um, what you typically expect is that you can lose some data. And when a data center, for example, goes away, it's usually preceded by networking problems and, and other issues. And that can actually drive up, because you know, your asynchronous replication could happen in 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. It's usually very fast. When something does go wrong, sometimes you actually have a bit of a backlog and that asynchronous replication is not happening, even though you're committing things on the primary still. And that can actually cause, you know, you hope it's less than a minute, but there's oftentimes it's more than a minute uh, in terms of data lost. That's not, that's not so great. Um, and you also expect that the recovery time objective when you actually have a major failure in a, a data center, like a replication site, uh, can be, you, you hope it's in the minutes. It's rarely in the seconds because these things can be slow if they're automated. And uh, sometimes they're actually manual, so you have to have a human involved. Uh, you typically see active-passive. That's the most common because it's probably the, the, this, the sort of simplest conceptually and people can make it work. Um, and you know, the problem with that is you have eventually consistent reads if you're actually using those secondaries as reads. And then you have active-active. This is a very hard thing to configure um, correctly and successfully in production with Golden Gate, but some, some folks have done it. Um, the problem here is if you're writing to multiple places, you actually have eventually consistent writes as well. And that can be something you have to take into consideration. So we want to propose a better way. In fact, we've proposed it. And it wasn't just us. This is kind of the way the industry is moving, to be fair. 
Um, and what we're looking for here is zero RPO. This is a major win. Right? You're not going to lose data when you have a, a data center outage. Um, and in fact, we expect that the recovery time is really just going to be in the seconds. Um, you know, our expected time for the way Cockroach comes out of the box configured is 4.5 seconds. Um, so what you're doing here is we're, we're, not, we're not dealing with failover. That's the wrong concept. Um, everything's active. You have three sites where you're replicating the data. Um, at least two of them will have the, the up-to-date data. Uh, when something goes away, you're just dynamically rebalancing client traffic. And you might think that, okay, we need three sites instead of two. This is going to actually require a lot more CPU and utilization. In fact, it doesn't. It does require three copies. So you're using three times uh, 3x storage as opposed to 2x. But you actually get 43% higher utilization on your actual uh, you know, resources other than storage. And this, is, this number came from Google's empirical data when they built these systems at scale. So you can actually, with this consensus replication, even across uh, big distances, expect to see in the normal case two milliseconds on reads. And the write latencies, in order to get consensus, and you'll see this visually soon, uh, actually depend on the speed of light and, and networking, in effect. Um, we've actually run uh, TPCC 10K. We probably could run 50K, but it's actually expensive for, for us to run 50K. <laughs> but uh, 10K with chaos, and what chaos is, is kind of like the Netflix model where you actually bring nodes down. So we're running TPCC at full uh, you know, throughput uh, with nodes going down in the system. And so it's doing complex transactions with contention, uh, you know, with a big mix of different sort of operation types. So let's look a little bit at a regional cluster. This is a pretty interesting and common way to run Cockroach. And it's similar to what Amazon's doing with Aurora. Um, you have three data centers here between uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia uh, that are on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, so these green circles here are cities that, uh, that are sized by population that exceed 100,000 people. And you can see that at the bottom there's a little legend that shows what latencies are. And these are latencies for an end user. Think of a mobile device or a, a web server or a, a web browser actually accessing a service that's running in all these data centers. And Cockroach is, of course, running in all these data centers as well and mediating the replication. So if Nashville, if a user in Nashville wants to access this service, they might have about a 10 millisecond hop to get to the closest data center, which is going to be Atlanta. Uh, then, you know, that operation, whatever they've requested, is going to potentially do some reads and um, do some writes, and that might be, you know, a string of things in a transaction. Cockroach has uh, put a lot of effort into making sure that, you know, that sort of when you think of a SQL transaction from the begin to, you know, the various selects to the updates and inserts to the end transaction, we collapse that all into a single consensus latency. So uh, what happens is that Atlanta data center has the right, but it's not going to be committed until another one of the data centers agrees. So it sends those two replication requests to Durham and to Richmond, and the one that comes back first is going to be the one, it's going to be sufficient, and it will be able to return to the client. So in this case, it'll be 13.5 milliseconds. And then the request is returned as a successful, it's, it's effectively committed. Now if Durham goes away, uh, it still will work. It's going to be from Atlanta, and it's going to have to hop over to Richmond. And that's the one that's going to come back first, because you know, Durham is either going to black hole the request, or it's uh, just going to return immediately that it's a failure. So now we have a 16.5 millisecond latency. That's still quite good. So if both of those uh, data centers are down, so Richmond and Durham, and Atlanta gets a request, it won't be able to work. So this is unlike uh, if you have just two, where one of the two is sufficient to make forward progress. With consensus latency, you need a majority. So, uh, you know, in this case, Durham's come back online, and it's up to date, and you're back to 13.5 millisecond latencies. Now, we'll just back up this slide, just so that you can see what the eastern seaboard of the United States looks like. These are all the big cities, and, uh, you know, what kind of, you know, latencies you're going to expect to see from uh, an end user to get into your application server. If you actually zoom out and you look at the United States, you see that West Coast is not particularly well served here. In fact, they have a fairly long hop over to your eastern uh, data centers. It would be nice if we could actually address that problem, and you can with Cockroach. So if you actually think about a U.S. expansion, this is a five data center case. So we've got uh, East Coast and we've got Texas now, which actually happens to be on a different power grid, so that's a, that's a pretty good uh, outcome. And you actually look at the latencies here. If a request comes into Atlanta, you need three out of these five. Remember, you need majority for consensus. So in this case, it would be the maximum latency that gets you three from Atlanta, which is 23 milliseconds. That's still a fantastic result. Um, we have five replicas now across the country. 
and you'll, you'll see why that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, but before that, it's, it's helpful to look at San Jose, which actually you know, is kind of off on its own over there on the West Coast in this particular configuration. And you know, to get to three out of the five, it's only 42.5 milliseconds. So it's still a reasonable uh, outcome. But what happens now if uh, you know, El Paso goes away and you have a request that uh, is being serviced from Des Moines? You actually have a, a great outcome here. It's 27 milliseconds. Things are great. Um, you can actually lose another data center in this case. So with five, you can lose two. And um, this isn't just sort of a, you know, a, a random example. This is how Google runs their AdWords system with five data centers. And the reason is that you can actually have a planned maintenance on a data center and actually have an unplanned uh, outage on another data center and still have complete continuity of your business. And if you actually think about this, we've lost two data centers here, and we're still getting 27 millisecond latencies on consensus. Now, the West Coast here is uh, not having as, as good a hop over to find an application server, but you know, it's still better than it was before because you got Day Moyne in here instead of just East, East Coast data centers. Now, if we zoom out, you see that uh, things don't look so rosy for the rest of the world. Um, they're all hopping over the United States, so that's not so great. Cockroach actually uh, has a solution for this problem as well. So we'll start with the naive case. Uh, and this is, you know, you're going to put, in this case, we have three replication sites, West Coast, East Coast, and in uh, sort of uh, Eastern or Western uh, EU in London. And you can see that a lot more of the map's green, right? This is, this is good. We've, we're serving EU now. Uh, the problem is that all of our latencies are going to be fairly high, right? Uh, if a request comes into London, you're going to expect about 100 milliseconds of latency. And if Richmond goes away, that sort of central link there, then you're going to have to make that full hop all the way to the West Coast. So you're seeing about 140 milliseconds on uh, any kind of right consensus. So that's, that's not ideal. Um, but we've done this, and in fact, it works. Uh, we've run TPCC 10K at this, and we get full throughput. The latencies are just higher, and they're higher by like 100 milliseconds. So it depends on your use case. This could be perfectly practical, but uh, we wouldn't necessarily recommend it um, because there's, there's drawbacks. So there's the latency. That's the obvious one. There's also data sovereignty issues that come into play here. EU users don't want their personal data having a you know, copy story in the United States. You actually do want to keep it within their legal jurisdiction. Um, this is... Um, very true in countries like Russia and China. Vietnam has laws. These data sovereignty things are popping up like mushrooms after rain. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's something that everyone's having to worry about and it makes the cost of doing business a lot more complicated. Um, but, you know, before we get on to the, you know, kind of where we're going from here, it's important to just think about what the current industry standard is. It looks like this. This is how most companies are running their data architectures. They have a, a single data center on the East Coast or on the West Coast. Um, and, you know, to the extent that uh, there is a failover solution, it looks like this for, you know, probably some number of minutes in the case of an outage, right? So, you know, th this is already a pretty big advance in the naive case, but there's, there's a better way to go. Um, when you actually really think about a global data architecture, you have to think about how you would build one. And the big thing here is that if you have a global application, you need a global control plane. In other words, think of it as like a single sign-on or a registration table, something that's globally replicated that gives you uh, sort of unique characteristics across your entire user, user base. And it turns out that's a small amount of, of data, uh, usually about less than 5%. You can do reads very, very quickly in all the replicas globally if you don't mind that they're not completely consistent and up-to-date. You can do that with a, a concept called bounded staleness. Um, and if you need to get consistent reads every time, then you're going to have a very multimodal distribution. Um, if, if they're least reads and they're local, you can get them very, very fast, um, but you may have to go all the way across the world for certain data if necessary. And your writes, again, are going to be fairly slow, 150 milliseconds. But that's a small amount of your data. The reality is that when you're building a global service, most data, like 95% of it, actually happens to be very local. And so it actually is going to be, um, you know, what, what I would consider regional. And you know, think of a, you know, a customer account, or if you're a SaaS business, the, the entirety of data for one of your uh, corporate customers. Um, in, in these cases, regional data, just like we saw in the, the US example, you can get very fast, consistent reads, and um, uh, very fast writes. So here's an example where we have many data centers around the world. You can see there's a lot more happy greenness. Um, so people can, you know, customers can reach uh, the application servers quite quickly because you have a presence in these various regions. 
Uh, if you talk about the global control plane, our rights are going to be fairly slow here um, from the EU. We're going to have to do about 162 milliseconds, or actually 140. China seems to be faster than South America there. Uh, and, you know, that's good, but again, it's, uh, you know, fairly slow. We'd like to do better, um, but this, again, is only the global control plane. If we actually talk about, you know, the very, uh, the much more common regional data, things look great. So we're talking about Australia here. You know, all the major population centers are, are green in terms of hitting application servers. Um, all of their uh, reads and writes are going to be extremely um, fast. Um, we have, uh, you know, EU here. Again, we're talking about, you know, 20 millisecond latencies uh, for the rights, uh, tons of cities there. It's kind of amazing. Um, China, even more amazing, uh, how many big circles there are in there. Um, we're talking about a, you know, a roughly 22 millisecond latency. Um, and then, you know, even South America here, uh, you know, this one, this particular configuration would have about a 30 millisecond latency. So you're actually able to, to run your application uh, very efficiently, very quickly uh, in all regions of the world. Um, in cases where, for example, a user in your service is interacting with another user that actually, you know, the two regions are very different, like someone in Buenos Aires is interacting with someone in London, that, that uh, interaction will be slower. Right? So that's fine. It means that your application developers can, uh, you know, uh, write very straightforward code, and the thing, the, the, the performance of the system degrades gracefully. So, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing here is that this idea that asynchronous replication is the, uh, the correct way, maybe the only way to get performant uh, database operation, uh, it should be sort of thinking from the past. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite possible to have zero RPO and low latencies, even in a global um, case, if you do this kind of partitioning correctly. And I think that, you know, one of the big sort of ahas for me is just to think about, you know, how people describe businesses and then how that would map into the kind of technology that's available now. You know, there's this idea of a regional uh, business and then a national business and then a multinational business. Um, the way that we'd think about that is, you know, you're starting with a sort of resilient but local cluster, and then you might do geo-replicated uh, for sort of a, you know, a, a continental sort of uh, business uh, footprint. And then clearly you're going to need something like geo-partitioning to truly be a multinational if you want to have a global service. Great. Yes. Very nice. Uh, just one question from me, and I'll uh, pass on to people. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about the, the company, the business side, how you guys have been growing this um, over the last, I guess, couple of years. Yeah, so we actually got started uh, in 2015, and uh, the actual GitHub project was started in 2014. So I worked on it nights and weekends for about a year. And then, uh, you know, that GitHub project got a lot of momentum. So, uh, you know, we had great VCs, including Firstmark, uh, you know, interested in funding, and we took the money and we ran with it. So this is kind of like throwing kerosene onto the fire, and we got to hire uh, really great developers, and uh, the, the system's been, you know, three years in R&D, and just this year did we start actually selling it. So it's an open source database, but it's an open core model. So we have, uh, you know, the Apache licensed core, which is the bulk of the code, and then there's enterprise features. And we've taken a slightly different take on the open core model. We don't have a, an enterprise edition that's closed source. All of our source code is, is available. It's all in the same GitHub repo. Some of it's Apache licensed, and that's strict open source, so you can freely redistribute that. And then some of the data is um, a different license. So there's a mixed license in there. And our license that's enterprise is based on Apache. It's just modified so that there's not a free redistribution right for commercial use. Who's a great customer for, for this uh, in terms of industry or what have you observed or geographic scope? Well, one interesting one is Comcast. And uh, they're, they're using it only in the United States, but they're actually using this geo partitioning feature. And the reason they do that is that, you know, the United States is a big continent, and you can actually have uh, geopartitioning across regions in the United States. So your East Coast users are geopartitioned, and your West Coast users are geopartitioned, and they uh, 
sort together and things are guaranteed to have uh, good release placement and things like that. So I think that's a, a very exciting future direction as people think about edge cloud, right, where you, for things like autonomous vehicles, uh, IoT devices that become transactional agents on the edge, uh, AR, VR, entertainment, um, for these kinds of things, very low latency makes a big difference. So where we're in, in those latency maps, we have that uh, you know, spectrum from red to, to green. You actually want to have your applications sitting in the same city. So uh, us New Yorkers, you know, we, we want to hit through 5G a, uh, you know, some sort of fairly local office that's in, the, in this area where we have less than 10 millisecond latency, the applications um, running in like a 5G substation and is accessing the data there as well. We have a microphone somewhere. Yep. So on your map, um, I noticed that when you were talking about the mobile strategy in Africa, it looks very red. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, this is, I, I, I felt a little bit bad about, um, you know, putting too many replication regions on there, just because we haven't even run it in that configuration yet. Um, you know, if you really wanted a global service and you had customers in, you know, every continent on the planet, then of course you'd have, uh, you know, something in the most populous regions of Africa as well. Um, then this is just a, a facile example, so don't take it too literally. China would pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently they would these days. We have time for one more. Is this one more over there? Yeah, I'm just wondering what's the programming model because you said that it's the intersection between relational and NoSQL. So how, how do you approach that? Oh, it's, it's actually SQL. So it's full SQL, it looks like Postgres, it actually looks like a Postgres server, it uses the wire protocol, their dialect even, um, we don't support all of the extensions that Postgres has at this point, but it looks very much like Postgres. So you can use all the tools uh, that have evolved in the ecosystem for Postgres and um, you know, all the transactions and you know, guarantees and secondary indexes, all of that works the same. Um, where it's considerably better than Postgres or you know, different at the very least, is in the resilience model, uh, this consensus replication. Um, also, for example, we've, you know, elevated correctness to, you know, I, I think an unusual level for a database, partly in res as a result of recent research around concurrency-based uh, attacks. It's something called acid rain. It's a paper that came out recently, um, which kind of tipped us off that you know, concurrency is a bigger problem than people think. You know, if, if you, I'm sure many people in this room are familiar with SQL, and typically when you're using it, you're using a default isolation level like read committed or something like that that has higher performance. We actually use serializable, and it's not even an option. It's everything is serializable, which means your application developers never have to know when they have to do a for select update or something like that in order to lock safely if they're just using read committed or even if they're using snapshot isolation, which is a much better isolation level than read committed. We use serializable across the board and a lot of the special sauce and cockroaches, how do we make that as efficient as possible so that's a practical thing to do. All right, on this note, thank you so much for coming back and for the update, very exciting, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.